so uh, thank you, Joan, for uh, having invited me here today. And thank you for uh, all you guys coming to this uh, seminar today. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be here. Uh, as you can notice, my, my first language is French, so sometimes I do a little mistake, but it's all fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so that's the reason why usually I do write my, my talk, but in a way that is uh, easy to understand and to communicate. So, uh, did you hear me well uh, in the back over there? Yeah, okay. Because I prefer not to use a microphone because we're stick in front of a microphone like this and, and I don't like to do that. So if I don't speak loud enough, please let me know, okay? And I will use a microphone or speak louder. Okay, so uh, the talk that I will give today is based on two different set of data. Uh, the first set of data uh, on which it is based comes from two papers that uh, have been recently published. And for those who are interested in having a copy of these, uh, these paper, I've brought some copy here in front, so you can pick some, uh, some, some copy if you want. So, uh, so some data, yes. So the, the first part of the talk, the main part of the talk, is based on the data on the result uh, of a research study that has been published so far in two papers. And, uh, and th this, uh, th this study was about the perception of biomedical scientists and clinician scientists toward the uh, social science. So what, does, uh, the, what do these uh, two groups of scientists think of social scientists, so people like me? Uh, so there's two papers uh, out there. And then after uh, the second part, or, you know, I will, will uh, uh, spend a few minutes on this at the end of, of this first part. Uh, I will spend a few minutes on my personal experience as a sociologist uh, coming from a department of sociology, so coming from the, like, the core discipline of social science and moving into the health research uh, environment. Uh, I must say it was a, sh it was, it was a shock. Uh, the culture is, the scientific culture is different and there's some uh, adaptation to, uh, to do for someone like me who has not been trained in the uh, clinical or health science uh, environment. So, okay, so with, with, do, with these two set of data, I hope like to, 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 uh, to bring to light some of the issues uh, related to practicing social science research in the health domain. So the, the key questions underpinning my talk today can be summarized as follows. Are qualitative social scientists welcome in the health research domain? If they are welcome in that domain, can they do their work according to the rule and standard used in the social sciences? And then after, another question is, if the social scientists are not welcome, what are the reasons for that? So let me first address the topic of my talk through the result of my uh, latest uh, research uh, project. So yeah, so as you know, uh, funding agency like CIHR, university leaders as well, want to develop interdisciplinary research. This is one of the, the reason of the creation of the CIHR in 2000. And they want to include social science into the health research domain. So, CIHR and university leaders and other people want to remove organizational boundaries to have various disciplines working together. That's fine, that's good, this is not, we cannot critique that, this is good. But beside organizational boundaries that are, you know, that leaders try to remove, there are still cultural boundaries. Cultural boundaries is pretty much what in a, in a synthesized way, is what people think, uh, let's say, what, what perception they have of another group. So is it because the organizational boundaries are removed that the cultural boundaries will be removed as well? That was the focus of our uh, research project. So that's why we investigated the perception of biomedical scientists and clinician scientists about the social science to investigate the cultural boundaries. And that question is uh, <coughs> inspired, uh, brought from the work of Pierre Bourdieu, the French uh, sociologist who have worked extensively on culture and cultural boundaries, and also on the work of Thomas Guerin, the American sociologist who has developed the concept of boundary work. So we have investigated boundary work. What do they think of us 
people like me, and is it possible for us, you know, so, so yeah, so you will see uh, with the result. Uh, so the method now. So to investigate uh, biomedical and clinician scientists' perception of the social sciences, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 31 biomedical scientists and 30 clinician scientists. All targeted scientists were members of peer review committees at the Canadian Institute of Health Research. We selected these scientists for two main reasons. Their position as members of peer review committee allowed them to exert influence on scientific activities. They're the one of the committees who participate in making the decision, the, the decision that who will be funded and who will not be. Second reason is that members of peer review committees are genuinely considered by their peers to embody an institutionalized definition of scientific excellence. So the number of respondents were uh, interviewed in each scientific community was determined using a uh, saturation approach, which is a commonly used uh, approach. The interview script uh, comprised 24 semi-structured questions covering nine themes, and for this study here, uh, two themes were analyzed. So uh, the first one is their opinions concerning the value of social science uh, in the health domain, and the second one was about their appraisal of different research methods particularly with respect to their relative bias and validity. And these methods were the experimental method, <coughs> sorry, uh, quasi-experimental, qualitative, and quantitative survey uh, approaches. To get an overview of how receptive biomedical and clinician scientists were toward the social sciences, we converted into quantitative data some of the results of the qualitative analysis. To do so, this is a technical part here of the talk. So to do so, we assign a numerical value between one and five to participants' responses to five questions concerning their perception of social science research. And moreover, beside that, because all respondents were asked to comment on issues related to non-experimental methods and the social sciences throughout the interviews, we were also able to make an overall rating of how receptive the biomedical clinician were with the entire interview. Two investigators separately conducted the quantitative uh, scoring. In the rare instances uh, of discrepant scores, uh, consensus was reached through discussion. Then we sum up uh, these numerical value and calculate the means for each respondent. So this calculation allowed us to position them, the scientists, on a continuum from one to five. One indicating a highly unreceptive attitude and five a highly receptive attitude and three, or around three, a somewhat ambivalent one. We call uh, that score the receptiveness score. So I will now turn to the uh, findings. <coughs> so two salient trends stand out from the result. First, both clinician and biomedical scientists' receptiveness score range widely, from a very negative attitude to a very positive one. Neither group were homogeneous when it came to assessing social science research. Biomedical mean score ranging from 1, this is very negative, to 4.6, pretty high, and clinician scientists from 1.2 to 5. The second trend now is that clinician scientists tended to be somewhat more receptive to the social sciences than were biomedical scientists. Results show that approximately half of the clinician scientists tended to be receptive to social science research. This is about 12 of 30. And only one quarter of the biomedical scientists exhibited the same posture, 8 of 31. Conversely, approximately half of the biomedical scientists tended to be unreceptive to the social science. 
this is 16 of 31, and only one quarter of the clinician scientists tended to be similarly unreceptive. Respondents who had a score between 2.5 and 3.6 were considered as being ambivalent because they showed to be in turn receptive and unreceptive toward the social signs depending on the issue address. Seven of the 31 biomedical scientists fall into that category and 11 of the 30 clinician scientists fall into that category. I will now explore uh, respondent rationale for supporting the appraisal of uh, social science research because don't forget this is a qualitative study, it's not quantitative. But we wanted to Let's say to show the diversity of posture or opinion toward the social science. So that's why we use a number to do that. It's really hard to do that with, when there's no number. For that study, we thought it was the best way to do it. So uh, I will uh, first focus on the scientists who were receptive to the social sciences, and second, on those who were unreceptive. Uh, biomedical and clinician scientists who were receptive to the social science used three key arguments to support their position. First, for them, social science research questions are just as relevant as those of the biomedical and clinician sciences. Second argument, the methods typically used in the social sciences are just as scientific and rigorous as those used in the biomedical and the clinical sciences. Third argument, some aspect of health can only be studied by the social sciences. Moreover, for most of the receptive biomedical and clinician scientists, the legitimacy of a method, whether it be experimental, quasi-experimental, quantitative or qualitative, so the legitimacy of a method essentially depends on its capacity to adequately respond to a research question and not to the degree to which it conforms to a given scientific paradigm. According to these receptive respondents, there is no universal criteria that would make it possible to determine a priori the superiority of one method over another one. Rather, as emphasized by a respondent, the scientist must decide which method is the most appropriate for each particular question. Here's the quote. The choice of method depends exclusively <coughs> on the research question. Certain questions can only be uh, studied using qualitative methods. One must therefore use them without asking oneself if they are less rigorous than quantitative methods. All methods are rigorous, it depends on the way in which they are used. It is noteworthy that many of the receptive biomedical and clinician scientists showed a critical attitude toward their own research practice. These participants acknowledge that their, that their science, the science that they do, is not, is not more objective or better than the social sciences, including the qualitative research. The science they do, as they say, just as any other kind of science, include interpretative components. Here's a quote. It's not fair to critique the social sciences by saying they interpret data, because we do that all the time in basic science when we get data that doesn't fit with what we expect. When that happens, we start looking at alternative explanations. So, my first answer would be that there is more bias in social science. But if I were really thinking, uh, if I were really th uh, thinking critically, which we don't often do, <laughs> I might probably be willing to sit on the fence and say it is probably the same in basic science. So that's interesting. And I must say that, <coughs> you know, we've talked, you know, in total to 100 scientists. And when you talk to a scientist for about an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, I want, you know, there's this, uh, the public discourse, you know, say, ah, biomedical science, clinical science is more objective than social science and all that. This is what they say, because this is what they, this is a public discourse. But when you start to investigate and to be with them and uh, install a climate of, uh, a climate of, what's that in English, uh, a common understanding, 
I'll do whatever. Okay. So they start to reflect on their own science and open up and to say, well, you know what? Uh, actually, you know, we got that result recently, uh, and we had to give a lot of thinking into what it means because they know that data don't speak that they by themselves. It's the interpretation that makes the science and make it interesting. So you know, so, so they are uh, aware that they they do as well interpret the data that they get. So before now, <coughs> turning to the unreceptive scientists, uh, I'd like to spend some time on the clinician scientist views of qualitative social science. More specifically, I'd like to ask the following question. Although, as we have seen, <coughs> half of the clinician scientists appear to be receptive to social science, are they actually receptive to the kind of science that social scientists do? The answer to this question, based on the, on the study, is not necessarily. Clinician scientists, among those included in our sample, are receptive to a very specific type of qualitative social science research. The social science they are receptive to have to meet a set of assessment criteria focusing predominantly on methodology. That is on how the study was conducted and not on the content of the study actually. Based on the interview data, which I must say support my own experience, it could be argued that for the clinician scientist, good methodology equates good qualitative social research. A good research is one that makes use of at least of some of the following methodological tools. Multiple coding, purposive sampling, sample saturation, triangulation, member checking, peer debriefing, audit trail. The problem that I see here is that social scientists themselves don't prioritize these methodological tools and often don't even use them. And, and yet, social scientists are the expert in, the social, in social science research. So that's interesting here, and we have not further explored that, but there's certainly a, research, a very fascinating research project to understand this, this two set of e evaluation criteria. Thus, <coughs> clinician scientists may manifest an attitude of receptiveness toward the social sciences, but their receptiveness remain conditional to the fulfillment of specific criteria. Clinician scientists seem not to be open to the social sciences as they are conducted in the social science domain, but rather they are open to a very uh, specific kind of social science that is not predominant outside the health domain. So if I go back to the title of my presentation now, can qualitative social science make it in the health research field? Well, we may hypothesize at, that, uh, hypothesize at this point that yes, social science and social scientists can make it, but at the condition that they follow a set of methodologi methodological rules. So I will now turn to the <coughs> unreceptive uh, biomedical and clinician scientists. These scientists' unreceptiveness is linked mainly to a narrowly defined conception of legitimate science. For these scientists, the best science necessarily involves the performance of an intervention on variable. First argument. <coughs> this intervention must be done in a controlled environment or with randomized sample in order to permit the establishment of a causal relationship or a correlational relationship. Third argument. Result must be reproducible to ensure that they are not due to chance. Given that social sciences, and more particularly qualitative research, cannot satisfy these criteria, the unreceptive respondent hold them to be unscientific. Say like it's what we do is, it's anecdote, opinion, it's not scientific at all, we should not fund that. Consistent with their definition of legitimate science, 
all of the uh, unreceptive biomedical and clinician scientists asserted that there is a hierarchy among research method. In their opinion, the experimental method is at the top because it epitomizes legitimate scientific procedure. Quantitative social research is ranked second. Although this type of research produce, in their view, objective and quantified result, the statistical analysis only allow the establishment of, cor uh, of correlation among variable rather than causal relationship. And then qualitative uh, research is ranked last. It is perceived uh, as being devoid of any scientific foundation. Physical. <coughs> Experiment uh, where there is perturbation of some parameters and measures to establish causality is sort of the highest level of scientific research. And then the next level is looking at relationships. And this would be quantitative surveys and epidemiology. Interviews and focus group, their anecdote, their opinion, and opinion are not science. I will now, okay, so uh, this is for the uh, key finding for the unreceptive scientists. I will now say a few words about the uh, rationale of the ambivalent. So those, you know, who don't know really if they are receptive or not receptive, depending on the issue at stake. <coughs> so the, the ambivalent uh, were characterized by their cautiously accepting position toward the social sciences and especially by their reservation about qualitative methods. When asked to assess the, the value of qualitative versus quantitative methods in terms of their rigor, the vast majority of these respondents felt that the quantitative methods were more rigorous and the result more objective than in the qualitative uh, research. So now, okay, so uh, I'll move on to another part of that study, the exposure to the social science. The question that we asked, that, that came from, yeah, that came from the, some of the results, and then after we focus a bit more on, on that part as well, as we were, uh, uh, the, the research project was evolving. So it's about exposure to the social sciences. The question is, how can we explain the variation in biomedical and clinician scientists' receptiveness toward the social sciences. The analysis that we have uh, conducted of the interviews suggests that exposure to social science research may play a role in this respect. But again, I want to uh, emphasize the fact that that was not the uh, main focus of our research, but since it was coming out of the result, we uh, have uh, included questions about that, about the professional trajectory to see to what extent exposure could be, could play a role in the receptiveness of the uh, scientists. But again, this is a, a also a, uh, an aspect of the research that should, th that should be uh, thoroughly investigated. So coming back to, to the result. Okay, so. The respondents who showed a greater receptiveness to social science were those who had either collaborated with social scientists, participa participated in the development of a social science research project, or evaluated such project as a member of an interdisciplinary peer committee. So the figure that uh, I'm showing now, oh, it's really hard to see there, okay, because the, the color, the contrast is not, uh, what, clear enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, okay, the figure should, okay, among the receptive, okay, so this is the uh, upper part here, uh, among the receptive, about three quarters, okay, 70, okay, 70, so the, so the receptive here, the 17 here were exposed to social science, and four of them were not exposed to social science. And it was the, the reverse for the uh, unreceptive. Uh, 18 were have uh, been not exposed to social science and seven were exposed to social science. Uh, we thought that was interesting. It's, 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 it indicates, it shows a, a trend 
that would uh, require uh, further uh, research. But we thought that was interesting. Uh, here's a quote uh, about the export, you know, what, what happened when a biomedical scientist is exposed to social science. So like most of my colleagues in the biomedical sciences, I thought that rigor and logic were the characteristic of the basic sciences. But when I, I got to know the social sciences better, I realized that logic and rigor actually constitute one of their strength, and that for me was a real shock. <laughs> so we can see here, uh, there are other data in the study that show that, but we can see here how the biomedical, the biomedical science world and the social science world, we can see how far they are from one and the from one another. It's really two different worlds. Basic scientists know most of basic scientists know absolutely nothing about the social sciences. Clinical scientists, it's it's different. They're pretty much in between. Some of them know of you know the kind of work that we do. Some other, well, though you know they they have sometimes like a distorted perception. But you know, so clinician scientists stand in in the in the center. But biomedical scientists, when I was uh, asking them to participate in the study, they could not even like understand what kind what kind of result that kind of study could could could, could generate. It was a total misunderstanding. And also uh, during the interview, when they talk about you know, social science, qualitative research, and all that, the uh, the description. You know, when they say, oh, yeah, I know qualitative research is about this and that and this, but the description that they do at that time is something that was, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say that in English really, but was irrelevant, was, was, <laughs> was, was not, you know, it, it's a, the description that we're making about the kind of work that we do has no relevance to what we do exactly. So uh, basic science and social science, it's like two worlds apart, absolutely, based on, on our study. So, <coughs> to conclude uh, the presentation of, of this, uh, of the result of our study, uh, I would like to highlight uh, four, four aspects now. So, <coughs> the perception of uh, social science research differ importantly both among biomedical scientists and among clinician scientists. Uh, that was something, because you know, the public discourse, the dominant discourse in the social science is pretty much, well, this is only my own perception here, okay? But when I first entered that study, I was thinking that clinician scientists, okay, all these two groups, all people of these two groups would reject social science. And I have to nuance my view now. Some of them, you know, they, they think that, you know, social science is a legitimate form of science, so it's not black and white. So that was interesting. So, uh, so, so thus, each of these two communities two cannot be considered as being homogeneous when it comes to how they relate to social science research, okay? So the second aspect is clinician scientists seems to be more receptive to social science uh, than biomedical scientists, and a potential explanation, uh, this is based on the literature, so a potential explanation may be that it's because clinician work, uh, uh, as, oh, sorry, a potential, a potential explanation may be that it's because clinician work with people. So they have uh, developed a better understanding of the usefulness of social science, uh, better, yeah, they have developed a better usefulness than bench scientists who work in the lab. Uh, however, uh, as I have uh, highlighted, it remain unclear to what kind of social science they are open to. Uh, the third point, uh, because uh, most biomedical scientists tended to be unreceptive to social science research, it is arguable that they would be, that they would be more inclined than clinician scientists to create a cultural boundary hindering social science research entry and development into the health domain. And the fourth one, if funding agencies and university leaders want to uh, foster interdisciplinary research in health, including the social science, 
it could be worthwhile to develop educational mechanism to better educate biomedical and clinician scientists about the usefulness and rigor of uh, social science research. So that concludes <laughs> the, uh, the report of the, of the finding uh, of our uh, research. And now I would like to, uh, to talk en mon nom, in my name, uh, based on my professional uh, experience about uh, can we make it? Can, can, can social science and social scientists <coughs> make it in the health research uh, environment? Uh, so that's the question. The answer, and uh, we may discuss. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's, it's yes, okay, in my okay. It, it, it all depends what uh, the social scientists do. Yes if we follow the rule of the game in health research? Absolutely, yes. A social scientist can be absolutely successful in this domain, yes. But if someone like me, let's say, I've been trained in the core discipline of sociology, which is a basic science, uh, if you do theoretical work, and if you persist in doing this and playing your game <coughs> of social science as a sociologist, the way that you have learned it in your department, uh, it, it, it's challenging. I, I could say that, yeah, it is, it is uh, challenging. So, so we're talking about the rule in the medical health domain. Uh, what are these rules? Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so I guess that everybody here in the room understands. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but but this is problematic. Well, it, it is it is challenging. I, I I don't want to become you know too not emotional but too uh, <laughs> engaged. Uh, okay, so I think that lots of people here come from uh, public health. Uh, I don't know much about public health. I know more about research and medical education. So I will talk from my own perspective in medical education research. Okay? Uh, it could be similar in public health. We can talk about this later. So, the, okay. So, when we, uh, so the rule in, in my domain is to publish uh, in clinical journal. In clinical journal or clinical, or, or clinical type of journal. The word count in, the, in this journal is, is 2,000 words. You know, between 2,000, 3,000, doesn't go much over 4,000, don't see that very often. So, okay, so that's one characteristic that can become a constraint. Uh, the second aspect is that in, in clinical journal or clinical type, uh, the, the editor and the community of the readers expect uh, some useful information. Uh, to solve problem, to address an issue, and things like that. Uh, so that's a second characteristic. It's oriented toward problem solving or addressing an issue, let's say. Uh, no theory or very, 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 uh, 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 very low, uh, <laughs> little, yeah, yeah, very little theory. Uh, the analysis uh, mostly in clinical journal would be a descriptive uh, analysis. Uh, analysis never go or very rarely go beyond uh, a descriptive analysis of the data and they don't they don't build on a theory that may help explain the underlying social processes. Uh, most of the papers, well, yeah, mo a lot of, I, I, I have not conducted a survey on this, on the research, but based on my experience, lots of papers using qualitative research are also doing grounded theory. Mm -hmm. uh, from a sociological perspective, uh, grounded theory is not a theory. Grounded theory <laughs> is the acknowledgement that you don't have a theory. So, um, so okay, so we we could debate this, but in sociology, uh, that this is the main perspective on grounded theory, which is good. It's fine. It, it's okay, but people sometimes get misled uh, that they think that if they do grounded theory, they're doing theoretical work. Uh, we can debate this. 
Also, okay, uh, 2,000 word paper. So, of course, impossible to do a thorough review of the literature. It's impossible to do that. Uh, so you have to accept that rule when you write for clinical journal. Also, uh, another implication of the word, word count limit, no comprehensive uh, discussion at the end of the paper. Uh, about the data, you cannot really discuss the data, uh, you cannot go deep into the interpretation of the, of the data, and you cannot also discuss thoroughly the theoretical implication of your data. Uh, so that's another rule, you cannot do that. And because of this, uh, there's a limited contribution to basic knowledge uh, building. So if you accept to play the game according to these rules in writing papers, you're fine. It's no problem. It's okay. But if you feel that this is unsatisfying, intellectually unsatisfying, that you're not challenged really, okay? You feel that you're not, you cannot be like the top-notch uh, social scientist if you are constrained to these rules, well, these rules become a problem. Uh, so there's, so what's the solution? What do we do, you know? Is it possible to do in-depth theoretical work uh, in, in the health domain? Is it possible to do that? Not sure, I don't know. Uh, so that could be a challenge. So this is for uh, the writing of papers and to publish in clinical or clinical type of journal. So yeah, okay, so, but there's a, okay, there is an uh, implication to productivity. Uh, in my view, writing a paper between 8,000 and 15,000 words uh, it take more time mm -hmm. than writing a 2,000 word paper. Uh, this is from, I do both, so I'm speaking out of knowledge, professional, and career, no, I, I do both, that's my experience. So that, that has an implication on productivity, and we are assessed on our pro productivity. So when you go up for promotion, when you go up for, uh, when you uh, go, uh, when you, know, you go to CIHR, okay, and you, 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 uh, you ask for money, this is not the right wording in English, and the people in the committee are not social scientists. They're, they're, they could be so, some social scientists, but it could be some people from other discipline or profession. Uh, by default, they will look at the numbers of papers. I've been on CIHR committee, this is what we do. You know, the, oh wow, two page of paper, <laughs> this is impressive. <laughs> yeah, but then after what? Okay, how many papers, you know, how many word count? 2,000, 1,000, 3,000? So, but the first impression is that someone who's doing longer paper, like social science and medicine, let's say, it's 8,000 words, uh, and American Journal of Sociology, it's much, it's way more. So the numbers of paper is less. So you have to explain that to the committee member, why your productivity seem lower. It's not lower, it's a different rule of the game. Uh, but if we play the game according to the health, uh, the health, health domain, we have to explain you know, we have to provide these explanations. Uh, someone doing clinical uh, um, randomized uh, trial don't need to provide any explanation. They play by, you know, by the rule of the game. So it has an impact on productivity and on assessment. And then after, uh, you know, books, book chapters, report, and all that, these are also type of uh, vi uh, dissemination vehicle used by social scientists. Uh, in this domain here, you know, in health, uh, again, you know, if you write a book, uh, you, know, it, it's, you know, it takes time to write a book, uh, <laughs> and so, it, you know, it's, it's, so in terms of, you know, so it, it does affect the l'apparence, the appearance of your productivity. Again, you have to explain why why you're doing this and why the numbers is, is lower. Um, so, you know, it's, so it could be challenging, yes. And then after, okay, so if you don't play the scientific game according to the medical health research rules, well, it is unlikely that you will be successful in the health domain. Yes, it is, it is, yeah. It's, it's going to be really, really hard. 
or you would need to be very convincing to you a department chair uh, for promotion, let's say, it, it's harder. A potential strategy, let's say that you love sociology and you want to debate with your peer, let's say the American Sociological Association Conference, you want to go there, and everybody over there has, you know, books at Harvard, at Chicago, and all that, and you want to play with these people as well. A strategy that maybe is doable is to have a dual production, a production for the, you know, these guys over there in sociology or whatever the, the discipline in which you are, and another, uh, you know, another production aimed for you know the, the health domain in which uh, we are. This is a potential strategy. I must say I have tried it out. Uh, it working well. It's fine. I'm surviving okay. Uh, so so that could be a potential strategy. So this and my, my talk and the comment I have to make and all that. So thank you for your attention and we have can have a discussion now. I would like to invite questions or comments, but I have a request. If you don't mind coming here or coming to the front, because we are recording, so that we can record both the question and the answer or the comments. So if you please come here or there. I know it disrupts a bit the rhythm of the conversation, but don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Would like to start? Kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so just here? Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, thanks for your talk. Um, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I also have a question because I, I feel like you talked a lot about what it means to be a successful academic yeah. in the health field as well as in the um, social, social science, science field. Yeah. but I'm not sure how we define success and the one thing that I didn't hear you talk about is the actual outcome of our research and so so, so it was a lot about um, how do we further ourselves and our careers how do we get publications how do we show our chairs that we're successful and that we'll get tenure and promotion, but what about the, the participants that we're actually doing our research for? And so and so maybe that's part of the questions that we need to ask as well in terms of what methods we use and what approach we're taking. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so there's like two questions here? <laughs> it's not really a question, it's more a concern because okay. I think that as social scientists, and I'm in this boat as well, I'm a psychologist, I work in the health field and I have for a very long mm -hmm. time that my concern is, I already know all of this, I know what yeah. I need to do in order to further my career, yeah. but it's not serving the communities that I'm okay. researching, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. And and sometimes we leave that out because we'll, we get so um, kind of spiraled. Uh, in absolutely, oh yeah, yeah. By, by the system, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, in terms of success, you know, w you know, w w w it's my personal view here, everybody in the room here has their own personal view, uh, you know, uh, I define, you know, I, 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 I can know by myself if I'm happy with my work or not. I can decide that by myself. In my own office, I'll say, yeah, that's a good paper. I'm happy with this, yeah. But, you know, if I go out for promotion and my, my, the, the, the chair of my department and the people in my department decide that, no, this is, he's, not, he's not good, he's not successful. So there are like our own subjective criteria of the seeing ourselves as successful or predictive or being happy in our job, but there are their institutional criteria that they are constructed, sure, you know, absolutely, like obvious, socially constructed by, by a dominant culture. So in terms of success, uh, you have to follow the criteria of the institution for, for you to get promoted, to get money, and all that. You need to do that. As for the second part, what's the second question? What the participant get back to that? Uh, it's, I think, okay, uh, maybe people here have comments to do on this. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it all depends, you know, you, you, you can go back to, the, to, to, to your participant to, to, to provide them feedback about the, research, about the result of your research. You can disseminate your uh, report, uh, uh, papers, uh, things like that. Uh, this is the thing I can think of. I don't know if other people have suggestions about this. Yeah, Shifra? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that 
social science, generally speaking, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it was not, except for some part of it, that was focusing on qualitative research. But it was about social science in general, uh, quantitative and qualitative. I must say that the very most, very most of the clinician scientists, for them, that was pretty clear, that for them social science is qualitative. So I have uh, in our sample. So we have interpreted their 
the, interpre the interpretation that we have made of their uh, of, of the data was mostly about their perspective on qualitative research. The reason for that, the reason why the clinician were uh, conceiving social science uh, in a as a qualitative research uh, appeared to me there has been a lot of papers over the last 15 years, let's say, or 10 years in BMJ and other clinical journal uh, explaining what is qualitative research. So for th so that went to the, the clinician community, I guess. So, uh, so when they were talking, the example they were giving was mostly about qualitative research. Uh, so there was that. And then after some questions were pertaining explicitly on qualitative research. But I must acknowledge we have not conducted a study ex this explicitly and only on qualitative research. There are fuzzy area. So this is my answer to your first question. About the second one, well, look, you know, it's, we, we thought that uh, it was interesting to us. Okay, of course it's a qualitative study, it's not representative of the population, it's not a representative uh, sample, we know of that, that's fine. Uh, but still, we, there were uh, so five questions who were uh, close-ended question, uh, and we, we needed an answer of like, is it black or white? And then after we, you know, asked them to explain, he said it's black, okay, so why is this black? But first of all, was a close-ended question. Because we had this idea in our mind to do some quantification. Uh, I think that what it shows, what it brings to the research is that we can see visually that there it's not like three groups and there's not it's not only like uh, one uh, one big uh, group having one opinion, we can see the trends. And this is the, pur this is the purpose of converting qualitative data into quantitative to show that, you know, it's, it's not like black and white, it's a trend, and the trend is different from the clinician <coughs> in the biomedical scientist. Uh, so that was the reason why we did that. Uh, I, you know, I think you know, I think we see the trends, and it, it's it's doing a good job. The other thing, okay, yeah. So there were five questions, and also there was a, a sixth uh, numerical value that we have taken from the entire interview because we know it's not quantitative uh, research; it's qualitative. So we said, okay, so when we read that interview, what is the Gestalt, or the you know the broader opinion of that person. So we said, okay, is it like is that is that person really receptive, unreceptive? Just beside the five question, and because people talk, you know, uh, there are there are opinion that comes through, you know, what they say, their discourse, and all that. Uh, so so we did we took this as well as a as a measurement to to, to measure. So that's the best answer that I can provide to you. We think it, we think it's doing a good job. We see the trends, and we see it's not homogeneous. So it allows me to say that, you know. So I'm okay with this. 